first thing that you have to think about is um, that there's there's no perfect way to do it. There is going to be some trial and error. We have to know where we're at to know where we're going. The first thing that I would recommend someone do, okay, is to actually track what they are eating for two weeks. Figure out exactly what you are doing and notice, are you weight stable? Has your weight remained the same? Figure out, okay, let's say you're at 2,000 calories and, and that's kind of where you are. Um, so you understand where you're at right now and assuming that you are weight stable. The next thing that you have to think about is um, if you want to lose weight, and depending on how much weight you want to lose, there has to be a calorie deficit. That calorie deficit could be 30%, you know, it, it could be 20%, slow and steady. The more weight you have to lose, the higher the calorie deficit. The less weight you have to lose, the lower the calorie deficit because steady weight loss over time uh, allows you to maintain lean tissue. Notice I didn't just say muscle. Lean tissue is uh, organs, bone, it, it's everything, including skeletal muscle. Now, if you are wanting to put on muscle, then you would go into somewhat of a calorie surplus. And I, I think there's some controversy out there, but you do need calories, you do need um, food to put on skeletal muscle. And typically that would be anywhere from a 10 to 20% uh, calorie surplus. Now, after you've figured that out, I think the next question to ask yourself is, how much do you want to weigh? You have to know how much you weigh, and then you have to ask yourself, how much do you actually want to weigh? For me, I'm a small person. I'm about 110 pounds, believe it or not, five foot one, and I have about 120 grams of protein just because I'm, I'm super physically active, and that's where I start. So a, a great place to start, and the literature would support 0.7 to 1 gram per pound ideal body weight, which is double what is recommended uh, as the minimum to prevent deficiencies. We can all agree that the minimum to prevent deficiencies, which has not changed since 1968, is still 0 0.8 grams per kilogram. Uh, again, a better range is to figure out um, where you want to weigh and shoot for that. And that would be, again, 0 0.7 to 1 gram per pound ideal body weight. The next thing that you have to think about is how you're going to distribute that protein. In a protein hierarchy, really, the most important is that 24-hour protein consumption. But I would argue that there may be some benefit to uh, thinking about a plan of how you distribute to that. And that would really ultimately depend on your goal and how much protein you have to get in. In my book, I have a longevity track, and those are for people that really like where they're at, and they just want to eat the correct macros to maintain their body composition over time. And what we do know is that the first meal of the day is, is the most studied, and especially from a muscle protein synthesis response, especially from um, you know a metabolic response, that first meal of the day is the meal that is easy to test, and it's the one where all the literature is really based off. To my knowledge, I haven't seen um, literature that that you know, looks at initiation factors and muscle protein synthesis uh, very clearly at those second and, and subsequent meals, which I think is important to point out because these recommendations, it's how do we make recommendations that benefit people over time? So that's a very long-winded way of saying the first meal of the day is very critical to get right. And whatever your protein need is, uh, I still believe that that first meal should between be between a minimum of 30 grams of protein to upwards of 50 grams at that first meal. Are you ever left wondering whether these dietary and lifestyle changes you're making are actually having an impact on your health? This is where Inside Tracker comes in. You get a personalized picture of what's happening inside your body and a custom action plan to help you reach your health goals. There's five steps to the process. First one being choosing your health plan. Second, you get your blood work done and they make this really easy. They can come right out to the house. Step three is to get your analysis. Step four is to implement your custom action plan. And then step five is to retest and recalibrate. And that last step you can do periodically over time 
to continue to monitor what's happening inside your body and continue to tweak your diet and lifestyle. As a viewer of the show, you get 20% off Inside Tracker by following the link in the description and using the code JESSE20 at checkout. Sign up for Inside Tracker today to get a personalized picture of what's happening inside your body and a custom action plan to help you reach your health goals. We're going to get into the nuances. I want to pause you there because there's a lot to get into that you've already there's shared. There's a lot, a lot I just said, I know. I want to take it right back to the beginning when you talked about the first step for somebody is to go two weeks, journal what they are eating, and if they want to mm -hmm. lose weight, they're going to need to get into a calorie deficit. I just want to push back on that point a little bit and say, what if this person is sedentary and they start including resistance training like we're talking about today, but keep mm -hmm. the calories the same. Isn't there a good chance at that point they're going to start losing the weight without playing with the diet? There's some really, really cool hallmark studies that I would say, I mean, you definitely will lose weight in a calorie deficit if you're just increasing resistance training. Um, again, depends on uh, I mean, I'm sure it would improve body composition, but to the extent, to the extent that I don't, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, I can't think of a study off the top of my head because all the studies that I really look at are, um, either weight loss or obesity or a combination of, um, resistance training and the synergistic effect of dietary protein. But yes, if someone were to eat the same way as they do and do resistance training, would you see some benefit? Yes, you certainly would. And I'm not advocating for that. Obviously, we want to do all we can to no, it's, get it's our probably body, not the best body composition yeah. in a good place. But it's just for looking at the science and the physiology. I'm picturing somebody who is carrying maybe 20 extra pounds of fat and they have a typical type, you know, office job, they come home mm -hmm. and they have dinner with their family, maybe watch some TV, barely moving their body, but then they go and continue everything like they're doing, mm -hmm. but resistance train three days a week. My guess is six months down the road, they're going to have profound changes in how their body looks and they're going to, you know, burnt a lot of body fat from coming back to what we talked about before, putting on muscle and all the different benefits they're going to get. Yeah, and, and I do want to highlight that actually skeletal muscle at rest is not very uh, metabolically active or demanding. It is the reason skeletal muscle plays, I, I believe it's about 30% of resting metabolic rate, which is not, it's not huge. I mean, the brain is upwards of 20 something percent and that's much smaller. So it's really uh, the mass, the size of skeletal muscle. Um, but at rest, it's not incredibly active. Uh, from just an energy demand standpoint. It's really the activity that is required to get the muscle, the activity, you know, when you're also eating dietary protein at a threshold amount, it stimulates muscle tissue, which there's that thermic effect of, of feeding. Um, but there's also this muscle protein synthetic response, which is um, a bit energy demanding. And those are some of the ways in which I think about skeletal muscle really pushes the lever. And these are really great questions, Jesse. So I appreciate it. We're going to get to the breakfast and the muscle protein synthesis. But before we do, another piece on the calorie deficit. And whenever I hear those two words, mm -hmm. I think about shifting the basal metabolic rate. So if we start cutting yeah. back calories, it seems like there's a group of people that push back against that right away. And I'm kind of on the fence here. I don't have the mm. science to back this up. But if we start cutting back calories, say we do that over six months as a strategy to lose weight, won't the basal metabolic rate just come down and rebalance? So you, what you're talking about is adaptive thermogenesis. Yes, a strategy of just cutting calories to lose weight is likely not an ideal strategy over the long haul. But dietary protein has been shown to have some counterbalance to this adaptive thermogenesis for some of the reasons that I had just mentioned. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. Dietary protein is the most important macronutrient. It is essential. It is literally what we are made of. Carbohydrates we don't need, we can make it. Fat, what the essential fatty acid need is so little.